right. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Star Vista Parent Caregiver Education Workshop called School Engagement Strategies. My name is Alice, and I work with the San Mateo County Libraries. Um, San Mateo County Libraries strengthen our community by creating an inclusive environment for learning. And while we can't meet together in person at this time, we really hope that these collaborative workshops will continue to foster community among families during this unprecedented time. So thank you so much for being a part of our community. This program will be recorded and shared through various San Mateo County Libraries outlets, including a third party websites like YouTube or Facebook, so others can learn from this engaging experience at a later time. You will not appear on video and you will have the option to remain anonymous or sign up with a nickname, but don't worry, you can still interact using the chat and the Q&A functions in Zoom. We are thrilled to be partnering with Star Vista, a nonprofit organization that has been helping people throughout San Mateo County navigate life's challenges for over 50 years. Their counseling, crisis prevention, youth housing, and outreach programs reach tens of thousands of people in our community each year. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our presenter this evening, Anna Paula Garay. Hi everyone. My name is Anna Paula. Like Alice said, I am from Star Vista and I'm going to talk today a little bit about strategies for engaging in the system. Perfect. So a little bit about me. Yes, I'm with Star Vista. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and I work with around 50 clinicians who are based in around over 30 schools in San Mateo County. So we are familiar with challenges that students and teachers are currently facing, specifically geared towards mental health, but also just general challenges associated with COVID-19 and distance learning. So we can go ahead and get started. So some objectives for today, we're gonna kind of offer space for parents and caregivers to learn about and discuss school community building, kind of what that looks like, some important tools for that. We will explore some challenges and barriers to engaging with the school community. Obviously right now, there are very unique barriers with the distance learning, as well as providing resources and tips and how to gain support and connection with your school community since we're not in person. So just some examples of challenges and barriers to school engagement that we have noticed in our work as well as just across the country that have been recorded in general. So with distance learning, we're all still adjusting to this new normal. So this isn't anything any of us has been through before. And we're still kind of learning how things work, kind of waiting to see if schools reopen, what that process is gonna look like. So not only are we trying to get used to what it is now, but we're also possibly anxious for what it's gonna look like with hybrid or back to in-person models. When it comes to access to technology, we don't all have the same access. Um, some of us have faster internet, some of us have more devices, some of us, you know, are better, more well-versed with technology. And so getting in touch with teachers can be easier or more difficult. There's also language barriers for certain families where their primary language is in English. Um, so that's just kind of something to keep in mind. And then there are also personal and family stressors. There's financial stress, food insecurity, there's work schedules, especially for parents now that there's in we're in distance learning, work schedules kind of affect our children's ability to pay attention in class and have access to technology in a way that it didn't before. There's a lot of medical needs and fears, especially with those individuals that are high risk and very unique parenting challenges now that the kids are home every day, all day. Sorry, next slide. Um, so this is just a quick video. This, uh, there's about, there's going to be three parents who are sharing their experiences, kind of what it's been like to parent um, through this pandemic. It's just a really brief video. I will focus specifically on my daughter. My son did okay last year. He actually did fairly well. But my daughter, it, it really, I, I view it as a plane crash. I say it all the time, a plane crash. Um, I think my daughter was struggling with, as, as anyone in that age group, teenage, teenagers, and especially female, they need to touch, they need to feel, they need proximity. So it was the virtual um, environment, it was the calamity that we were facing, the unknowns of a pandemic, 
and it was being cut off from social contact that made it incredibly difficult for my daughter. Las clases que le están impartiendo a, en las escuelas son en inglés. Eh, hay, al, hay profesores también que dan su soporte para el español, pero todavía no dominamos el idioma bien. Y realmente es uno de los retos a, a el cual nos estamos enfrentando. For well, my child that's in third grade, it is very hard for her to keep up with her schedule. You know what classes she's supposed to go into. You're asking a third grader to be able to log online by their self to know what classes they're supposed to be going into and what codes they're supposed to be using. And to try to stay on task, it's, it's a lot. Um, so some of you might have been facing similar challenges to the ones illustrated in the video, um, especially with distance learning. So this is just something that you can think about if you want to put it in the chat or pose a question, you know, for further discussion, we can, you can do that as well. But just kind of take some time thinking about what are some challenges and barriers that you're experiencing in engaging with your child's school community now. It can be challenges that you've experienced in the past that are continuing, or it can be new as a result of the pandemic. So some key elements uh, to building community, especially within your school community, are your voices as parents and caregivers. You know, being able to share challenges requires a sense of safety and vulnerability. Um, but sometimes it's, and I, I will go in this further, elaborate further in this presentation on that, on the importance of being able to do that. Collaborating with teachers builds community. Understanding not only the emotional needs of our children, but our own emotional needs and how we communicate the expression of emotions and community and self-care. All of those things kind of work together to really build a community that we feel that we are a part of. So your voice is extremely important as a parent or care caregiver. You know your child the best. You are the expert ourselves as clinicians or teachers, school staff, anybody who comes in contact with your kid, we all get to know your child in a very, you know, unique, special setting. You get to see your child in all settings all the time. So you are the expert on your child. So if there's anything going on, you should feel comfortable being able to express that to teachers and school staff so that they can know your child the way that you do and be able to support your child in that way. So the second bullet point kind of supports that. So you really want to bridge the gap between school and home. We want the child to know that they are getting equal supports at school and home and that the parents and teachers are in contact with each other. In terms of now that we're with distance learning and even without distance learning, it's good for teachers to know the best way to get a hold of you. So whether that's, you know, updating your emergency contact form that you have with the school, giving them an updated cell phone number, even letting them know when you're free, when you're essentially your work schedule, so when you're not working, so that if they need to get a hold of you, they can. That can really foster communication with your child's teacher. Checking in regularly is also really beneficial, not just to make sure that your child is staying on track, but so that your child also has a sense of accountability when it comes to school. And if you're having a negative experience, you know, not with your child, not remembering all of their assignments because right now like we saw in the video you know third graders being asked to like log online and using different codes for different classes and being assigned homework virtually which is definitely new to an eight or nine year old you know share those experiences with the teacher that could be beneficial for the teacher to know so that they can maybe change up some things they're doing in the classroom to make it easier for their students to learn i know for example we work in um, Menlo Atherton High School, so for children who are a little bit older. And some of the high schoolers were telling me the other day that the, one of their, the hardest things that they're facing is time management skills. You know, before they had, you know, let's say they had one class every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but now teachers are having some assignments to Tuesday, Thursday. So it's getting to be really hard for them to remember when all of their assignments are due because now they're not necessarily due the day of the class, because with the virtual learning, they can be due anytime. You know, so any sort of feedback you're hearing from your child or noticing that they're struggling with is good feedback for your teacher. Um, so 
I, I use this website, Learning Heroes, and it's there's going to be a link for it at the end of the website. They have some fin really, really fantastic videos, um, worksheets, handouts that you can use. So to kind of help guide you and how to have those conversations with your teacher, kind of what to talk to them about, what to prioritize. Um, so some examples are some learning goals, right? You might have learned goals in terms of learning for your child. Your teacher will also have learning goals for your child. So kind of making sure that those are aligned. Challenges associated with COVID-19, if you're experiencing technology difficulties at home, if you have multiple children, they all need to be on at once. There's not enough rooms for each child to be in their own room, so they're talking over each other during their, their classroom time. All of that is good to discuss with your child's teacher so that they're aware of some cha challenges your child could be facing and kind of factor that into their learning. Um, some of their grades or credit if they're, you know, a little bit older and, and doing extra credit to make up for assignments and any sort of social interactions. Sometimes we take social interactions for granted in the distance learning because we think, well, the kids aren't seeing each other. Um, but in some of their classrooms, they still, and especially as they get older, this is more relevant, they still have the chat function. They're still interacting with peers. And as parents, we still kind of want to make sure that those, so those interactions a, are happening because we still want them to be feel socially connected to their peers, um, but B, they're, they're happening appropriately. So even in the chat that there's no bullying, for example, going on, and if that, that stuff is happening in the chat, then bringing that to the teacher's attention if the teacher hadn't noticed or if they're doing private messages, which is also possible via um, places like Zoom. And so like I said, Learning Heroes offers a lot of really excellent tips, so I encourage you to, to check it out. So your child's teacher is is really your teammate, and I think it's it's a really good idea to see the teacher as your teammate, someone who's really trying to go through this process with you. Um, so not only do we want to share, you know, what, how things are hard, you know, what's not working, but it's also important to tell your teacher some like the strengths and the good, amazing qualities about your child that you love. For example, let's say Timmy really likes cars. Timmy's in first grade, loves it. Maybe the teacher can incorporate cars in the math lesson. So I think that sharing kind of interests can really allow the teacher to pull your child in to distance learning and make them feel more connected to her and to the classroom since it's much more difficult to do than when we're in person. When your child is needing a little extra support, that's also a good time to loop in the teacher, right? Let's say there's some family struggles going on, you know, you went on vacation and got back and Timmy's having a really hard time adjusting to like having to focus on Zoom again after spending a week with his cousins. You know, just kind of, you know, cueing the teacher in a little bit so that if she sees that he's a little bit distracted in the Zoom class, for example, she kind of has a little bit of context and maybe won't call him out or won't be as worried about his behavior because she kind of has, she knows a little bit more about what's going on. And then if you feel comfortable to kind of share with the teacher if things if there are family stressors going on, that's also good for the teacher to know, A, so she can better support the student themselves, and B, so if there are additional resources that the school can provide you, for example, we have Star Vista clinicians at 30 schools. So if your child goes to one of the, one of the schools that we're in and the teacher hears about a family stressor and she's like, hey, I think Timmy could benefit from therapy or your family could benefit from family, family therapy, you know, we have the Star Vista clinician who's on site who can provide that therapy for free at no cost to you during school time. Um, so sometimes it's good to loop the teachers in because they might be aware of resources and be able to share them with you. Um, again, this is from Learning Heroes. Creating a plan with your child's teacher can be really helpful for everybody involved. Um, the, that way your, your child knows that at home, you are looped into what the teacher's asking, you know, there's less likelihood of them saying, oh no, I don't, I don't have any homework, or no, my teacher says everything's fine. But if you're, in con if you're in communication with your teacher and you both have a plan, then it's easier to, you know, keep your child on track. So this is just an example of how to do that. So specifically because I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and I work with all of the clinicians in our school-based program, I really wanted to address how to not only understand your child's emotional needs, but how to talk about emotions with your child, especially nowadays where your children are having less interactions with others. 
and are less able to kind of vent and talk to their friends the way they used to. So we will watch this uh, brief video. My name is Doris. My husband, David, and I, we have two children, Dahlia and Daniel. Hi. Go for it. Our hope for our children is that they are happy, confident, and caring so that they can thrive in school and in life. When I became a mother, it was very important for my children to be able to name and express their feelings so that they can better deal with their emotions. Remember these? When yeah. my children were very young, we started using picture books as tools to identify emotions within characters. Sometimes I'll ask them questions to help them begin to identify their feelings for themselves. I see a sad face. Is that right? Mm -hmm. If they can connect to their own feelings, then they can connect to others' feelings. They only had a little we make time daily to ask questions and practice listening. How was your day, Daddy? Oh, my day was amazing, Daddy. And I think it just really shows them how to be a good friend and the importance of thinking of others. Congratulations, Daniel. Tapping into feelings has helped my children with confidence and self-awareness. At school, they know how to manage feelings as they come up so that they can focus on learning. All right, so have a good day in school, okay? So I kind of wanted to address a little bit how to talk about emotions at home and how to create a safe space in order to allow our children to feel comfortable expressing themselves. Um, a lot of this is, you know, sometimes feels like common sense, but in the moment, you know, when we're trying to cook dinner and picking up around the house and there's laundry, these are things that <laughs> we just kind of forget about. So sometimes it's just good reminders. Um, but interestingly enough, all of these things come really naturally to kids. Um, so sometimes it just takes an adult to model them for them to also remember it sometimes. So we want to listen and reflect what they're saying, withholding judgment. If our children ask for our advice, then we can go ahead and give it. But in general, kind of helping them form their own solutions to their own problems or answers to their own questions really also helps develop some autonomy. All feelings are normal. Sometimes we tend to think that feelings like anger or jealousy are bad emotions and feelings like happy and excited are good. Where at, whereas actually all of feelings serve a purpose and all feelings can be used to teach us something. So kind of acknowledging that all feelings are normal. There's no good or bad feeling. Modeling a range of emotions and coping tools. So as a parent, we also feel a lot of emotions. We can feel really angry at times, really excited, really, I don't know, surprised, nervous, anxious. So showing our, our children that there's a range, right? You can feel a little bit angry, you can feel really angry. And how, how, do, how do I, as a parent, deal with it when I feel a little bit angry or really angry? And letting our kids see that, I think, is really important because it shows them that it's okay to feel that way as long as you have a way to cope with it. So modeling is extremely important. And then talking about safe and healthy ways to express tough feelings like anger or jealousy or frustration. Um, for a lot of younger kids, you know, when they get angry or frustrated, their go-to is like grabbing something and throwing things or having more of a physical reaction. So with younger kids, making sure that they're able to express those emotions without, you know, so much of a physical outlet. And other kids, they t older kids, sorry, they tend to internalize it more. So maybe a safer or healthier way for them would be to verbalize it. So kind of taking the, your child's age into account into how to express those emotions. So these are some examples of how to increase emotional awareness and coping tools. So emotion charades. This is a great tool that I have used in therapy sessions with children, especially younger children, um, where I'll have a deck of cards and they're upside down, and I just write a, feel, a, a feeling word on each card. And so let's say I flipped up happy. So I will act out happy, and the child will have to guess what emotion I'm acting out, right? And so then let's say they pick up sad. So they have to act out sad, and I have to guess what it is. That's an example of emotion charades. Watching a funny video together and sharing a laugh. Kids these days know every single funny video <laughs> there is on YouTube, for example. So asking your child to show you a funny video that 
they found or that the friend shared with them and, and watching it with them um, can be a really good kind of coping tool, especially if they're feeling upset. Learning something new together is A, a great way to bond with your child in general, um, but also a great way to kind of talk about and process through maybe some frustrations with learning new things. Reading stories together. A lot of stories, especially geared towards younger children, deal a lot with emotions. So reading through them and asking if they have any questions or like um, just how how is the llama feeling in, in this story? How do you think Spot the dog is feeling right now? And incorporating those questions into the story, whether the story prompts them or not. Sharing a high and low for the day, that can be better with older children. You know, my high of the day was that I got a 95% on my essay, my low was that I didn't do so well in math, or my low is that I still can't, I still don't get to see my friends in school. Um, and then parents also share a high and a low. So if you're doing highs and lows, then everybody in the family has to do that, not just one individual. Some really good examples of coping skills are some relaxation techniques. So taking some deep breaths, um, kids are, especially younger kids are really good that you can find some really creative ways to do it. There's a lot of YouTube videos that will guide to deep breathing that have owls and monkeys and all sorts of different creatures doing deep breathing. So if you want to use that as a guide, you should definitely feel free to get doing some body movement. So getting up and shaking and stretching, anything like that can also be really good for relaxation and noticing the five senses. So that's when you can ask your child, tell me one thing you can see, one thing you can smell, hear, touch, and taste. And that's just kind of letting them ground themselves into their surroundings and really be present in the moment. The perfect, here's a perfect example of how to model your emotional experience, right? So you might say, mommy feels sad. And when she feels this way, she can try to give someone a hug to feel better. What can you do when you feel sad? And having that and start to have those kind of more templated conversations with children. And then as they grow older and the more you do it, the more natural they'll become. So again, sharing with your child's teacher, especially when it comes to your child's emotional needs, some children need more support emotionally than others, right? And because you are the expert on your child, you are the most aware of what their emotional needs could be. So if they're needing a more additional support and you feel comfortable mentioning that to the teacher, the teacher might be able to provide additional resources to help you, whether it's at school or at home, providing that extra support for your child. If your child struggles with managing specific emotions, for example, like frustration, you know, working with your teacher to develop some possible responses for in the classroom. When you're in the classroom, it's a lot easier because the teacher can react in person immediately. In distance learning, if your child has, you know, difficult emotions and has difficulty processing them, there might be like some sort of agreement that you and the teacher can come to where if, the, if your child is exhibiting certain behaviors over a Zoom call, the teacher has like a go-to response for it that you were all on the same page about. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about self-care and community care. So taking care of yourself is taking care of your family. And when you make space to take care for yourself, you model this for your children. You show your children that taking care of yourself is a good thing that they, and that they should also take care of themselves. Even if it's just one intentional thing, it really makes a big difference in filling your bucket and feeling less drained and tired at the end of the day. And I know that sometimes it feels really overwhelming when people talk about self-care. It almost feels like something you need to add to your to-do list. But it really can be really small, kind of spontaneous moments throughout the day. So let's say if you're sitting in the car running errands, you've got a screaming child in the backseat, just taking a really deep breath at a red light and just noticing how your body feels. Even if what you notice is that my body is really tense and I'm really tired, take, just taking the time to check in with yourself and check in with your body is a form of self-care. If you're doing laundry, notice the way the warm clothes feel against your skin and maybe how they smell. Maybe that's a really good smell to you. So maybe just take a couple extra deep breaths in that moment. Listen to a song that makes you happy. You know, you can keep a gratitude journal or even wake up in the morning and say one thing you're grateful for or before you go to bed at night. These can really take no more than 15 seconds, but just being intentional about it throughout the day 
can really help you feel more connected to yourself and more connected to your family. And community care. There have been really numerous research studies that show that we are social beings and that feeling connected to others is really a vital part of our physical well-being, not just our emotional well-being. So if you're able to in distance learning, which I know is a very unique situation, to try connecting with other parents, whether that's by phone or video, your school might still have a PTA. There might still be PTA meetings. That would be a good way to meet students. Um, there's a possibility for you to ask your, uh, your child's teacher to host maybe like a virtual meet and greet for the other parents in that class in case that the parents want to be able to support each other joining online events like this one, you know, to kind of build a greater sense of community, get to know what else is out there, maybe get some helpful tips if that's what you're looking for. And even just sharing your experiences and knowing that other people are going through the same things can be really affirming and really healing. So here are just some, some main takeaways as we wrap up. Know that your voice is important. Everything you have to say with regards to your child should, should be heard and should be really taken in and observed, whether it's your child's teacher, a counselor, uh, even if it's like the PE teacher, once we're, back, once we're back in school, if you have something important to say to your child, you should feel empowered to say it. Connecting with your child's teacher to share their needs, strengths, and challenges, this just enables a teacher to really support them the best that they can. If you need to create a plan for that support, then there's a lot of worksheets that will help you do that. Understanding your child's emotional needs and how to communicate them with your teacher in case your child needs additional support and how to practice self-care and community care to really bridge the gap during specifically distance learning. And I guess now we will open it up for some Q&A. Right. Thank you for that presentation. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, so we have one question so far from the attendees um, and anyone else feel free to share in the chat or in the Q&A any other questions or your own experiences that you might think might be helpful for others. Um, so the question we have so far is, would you recommend setting a specific time aside each day to listen and reflect with kids about their day in school? That way it becomes routine I think that's a fantastic question. Um, historically, this is something that uh, my parents did <laughs> when I was growing up, and I've seen this done with a lot of children, is really around dinner time. Um, dinner time is just a really good time if you're able to all sit down together. That's a great time to have that conversation. If dinner time is more chaotic because there's extracurricular activities and work schedules, and that's just not a good time, then maybe right after the school day when you get home from work, it really varies depending on what your family's schedule is, but you're totally right. Finding one time that's consistent throughout the day to have that conversation is really helpful because then the, the child also learns to expect it. So let's say you're gonna do highs and lows, right? That's what you decide to do every day. Then the child knows that they have to come up with something, let's say before dinner, so they can kind of think about it and be prepared for it and not sit there being like, oh, I don't know, I haven't prepared for this. So then there's also less anxiety on behalf of the child to be able to have that conversation. Thank you. Um, we have another question that came in, which is, is a monthly check-in with teachers about your child's progress and share out about the created plan too much or too little? Um, I really think it depends on your child and your child's age, really. Um, older children tend to be, you know, typically more responsible, more autonomous in terms of their schoolwork. Young, younger kids need more help just in general, like staying on, on top of homework, especially now with Zoom, kind of trying to remember what's due, when it's due. Um, so if you notice that your child is having a hard time keeping up with it or remembering it, then once a month, you know, might be too little, right? Whereas if you've got a sixth grader who like seems to be doing okay, seems to be getting good grades, maybe that's enough. Um, so, and depending on your child's age, it might be a conversation you wanna have with them and say, hey, do you, do you need help remembering these things? Would it be helpful for me to like, for us to create, to sit down and create a calendar together and create reminders and write down due dates? Um, so I think that really just depends on your child's needs. Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to quickly say, um, 
I'm about to post a link to a feedback survey into the chat, and we'd really appreciate hearing from you about it. Um, we don't have any other questions from the participants, but I actually have a question. Um, my niece is in kindergarten, and she has to spend three or four hours a day on Zoom every day. Do you have recommendations for helping her cope with that much Zoom time? Yes. <laughs> um, typically, if, if the teacher isn't already doing this, this is a good something, a, a great thing to suggest to the teacher potentially in a check-in with him or her is to build in like five or 10 minute breaks, especially with the younger kids more frequently than with the older kids and have like a, there's a lot of videos on YouTube, love YouTube for like quick five minute videos for kindergartners um, where they can get up and has exercises, right? So that'll be like, like a big bear that's like, let's move really fast or let's slow our movements. Let's dance in the circle. Let's lay on the ground. So anything that gets their body moving really quickly in a short amount of time gets a lot of their like energy bursts out, which is what they really need. Um, so any, any like five to 10 minute break would be fantastic. And if the teacher's not doing it, that's a great thing to suggest for the teacher to build into their classroom. Thank you. Um, and we have a question that came in on the older end. Um, how are high school students responding to the distance learning school approach? I believe, Anna Paula, you mentioned you work with Menlo Atherton High School. Yes, so we currently have, I believe, five clinicians at Menlo Atherton. So I hear a lot about students' concerns and kind of ongoing issues with distance learning. So it was interesting. I heard from a student recently who said that um, time management has actually become more difficult. With distance learning, you have this deception of having so much more time available because you're not having to physically be in school. So you almost feel like you have all of this extra time to complete your assignments or like talk to friends when in reality, then it kind of leads you to not managing your time correctly. And then they're staying up until midnight or 1 a.m. to try to complete their assignments. And then they're like I mentioned earlier, having to keep track of when each assignment is due because now classes are meeting on a more irregular basis and assignments, she was saying, some assignments are due at 5 p.m. Some assignments are due at 11.59 p.m. Some assignments are due at 8 a.m. So not only keeping track of what day they're due, but what time they're due. Um, she said, she was she's a junior, and she said that her and her friends are all consistently kind of having the same issues with not remembering when things are due and having to check in with their teachers constantly to remind them. Thank you. Um, and someone posted in the chat um, that I think schools and school districts require the students to have like a certain amount of time in front of the computer. So that may be why it's not flexible. Yeah, yeah, some, some students are. Um, I think there are ways where even the, the teacher could lead like a five minute stress relief activity, whether it's like a little movement video or a mindfulness activity or some sort of meditation where they put some calming music for five minutes. They're still technically involved with the teacher. It's still on, um, but it's just a nice way to give the, the students like a, a mental break from having to focus so much. Uh, yes, that person said their seventh graders schedule is an hour and 20 minutes of class and then five minute break and an hour and 20 minutes of class again, so. Yeah, and the hour and 20 minutes seems, you know, realistic for seventh grade, probably not for a squirmy five-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question in the chat here, um, which is, are some parents implementing rewards to incentivize good distance learning behaviors for their children? If so, have you heard of what works and what hasn't? Yeah, I mean, that just kind of it's positive reinforcement 101, right? We use positive reinforcement. I have met with many, many parents and instituted positive reinforcement charts, even without distance learning. So realistically, if there's any sort of specific behavior, you really have to identify the behavior you want to change. Um, so kind of once you've identified that, whether it's, you know, sitting still in front of the computer for X amount of time for their, for their learning environment, um, completing their assignments on time or not completing their assignments on time, if that's a behavior you're wanting to change. In order to really do incentivize behavior, you have, there has to be an identified behavior to change. Once you have that, you wanna set really good expectations of what it would look like to change the behavior. So let's take the example of sitting in front of the computer, right? 
so let's say it's seventh grade or someone mentioned where it's an hour and 20 minutes of paying attention and then a five minute break. So let's say at like the 30 minute mark, that kid is like out of his seat. He's kind of bouncing around, creating a little bit of a ruckus. You know, you want to slowly increment the time that he's sitting in his seat. So for every 40 minutes, for example, that he stays in the seat, he gets a sticker, a star or whatever. And then every three stickers, he gets X prize. So you really wanna make sure that when you start off, the child understands what the expectation is, how many times they need to do it before they get like some sort of prize or reward and what that reward's gonna be. Um, as they get better, as they start meeting those goals and you wanna make it longer, right? So once he's got 40 minutes down, then make it 50. Or before, if it was for every three times they'd get a reward, well now it's every five and the reward changes. Um, so you wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page of what the steps are and that you can kind of make it a little harder to reach that goal, but maybe make the reward a little better to kind of keep pushing them towards the end goal. Right, thank you. Okay, um, I wanted to also mention while we're waiting to see if anyone has any other questions um, that there's a recording of the, the there will be a recording of the presentation um, and the list of resources as well as the slides will be made available at the link that I just put in the chat. Um, so if you wanna go back and reference any of what you've heard today or seen today, um, we'll be adding that to our website and you can do that. Um, I had another question at which, any point, oh, oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, if at any point, um, any of you have any questions in terms of mental health services throughout the county, um, I believe my email will probably be sent out with a list of, of resources. So please feel free to reach out. Um, if we don't have a clinician at your child's school, I will um, try to provide you with some resources that potentially could help out. Um, so just so you know, if you need an aid or you just have additional random questions, like the ones you know in the Q&A portion today that aren't necessarily related to mental health and you want to reach out, please feel free to do so. Great. Uh -huh. I had another question for you, um, which is, do you have suggestions for how to advocate for your child if a teacher is either hard to get a ho hold of or unreceptive or just really overwhelmed with things and you don't feel like they're adequately addressing your child's needs? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So I think similar to how it's good for us as parents to let, the, to let, our, te to let our child's teacher know when we're available, you know, extending the same courtesy to them, right? So if, especially if they're feeling very overwhelmed, you know, maybe Mondays for them are they're like super hectic, trying to get ready for the weekday. So maybe having a meeting with them on Mondays won't be so productive because they're gonna be a little more shut down and more stressed and probably less receptive. So I think the first step would be to kind of ask them when a good day to meet with them would be. Let's say hypothetically you've attempted multiple times, it's still not going well, you're not getting the help or support that you need to help your child. I would say that you should go to the principal and kind of not necessarily tell the teacher, but just be like, hey, I this is what I'm needing for my child. I have to try to communicate it with the teacher and th these things. This is what I'm needing and this is what I'm not getting. Like, could you help us out? Um, but just because your teacher isn't necessarily responding the way that, that you are, don't be afraid to kind of go one step further. Like, like I mentioned before, you're the expert in the child. You are their greatest advocate. And so you know, go the lengths that you feel you need to, to make sure your child is getting what they need to succeed. Thank you. Um, we have a few more minutes, so let's hold on and see if we get any other questions in from our attendees. Um, and while we're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and share that um, feedback survey link in the chat one more time, because uh, we would really appreciate your feedback on whether this session was useful for you, what you found useful, um, and what topics you would like to see us um, focus on in the future. So we would really love it if you fill out that survey. We have a question. Um, what are some books on school engagement that you would recommend? Um, 
I don't have any textbooks, especially because the situation we're in right now, school engagement looks very different. I don't think that there are any even books out that deal with school engagement during COVID-19. I think it's a little bit too fresh. Um, but like I said, that website, I believe it's bealearninghero.org, has some really good worksheets, templates, suggestions of how to engage the school, specifically your teacher. There's even like a little quiz that you can do with your child at home to figure out if they're actually at the right, if they've learned what they're supposed to learn for their assigned grade level, you can then take those results and, you know, bring them to your teacher. So I don't have any specific like textbook or book that you could buy on Amazon, for example, uh, but that's a website that I have found very helpful in working with parents. Um, and one of our other library staff, um, Nicole, just shared a link to that website in the chat. Um, and it will be also be shared out on that blog post later on if you need to uh, access it again. Um, and we have one last comment from an attendee that said, thank you, this was very informative. So, right. We have about one more minute. So if anyone has any last burning questions before we go. Um, and then I'm actually going to add my email in the chat just so that you all have it just in case. All right. And while you're doing that, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us this evening. Um, before you leave, please, please take our survey um, so we can hear what worked or didn't and any topics you'd like us to feature in the future. Um, this is the third in a series of parent caregiver education workshops led by Star Vista. And again, this workshop has been recorded and it will be made available for viewing on our YouTube channel for anyone who was unable to attend tonight or if you'd like to revisit the resources you meant that were mentioned. Um, and if you're interested in attending future workshops in this series, um, go ahead and visit the library's website, smcl.org, or you can click on that blog post link and it will take you to our website with more information about other workshops. So. Thank you again so much, everybody, and have a wonderful night.